Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Snellus, where medicine makes perfect sense, and today I have a neuro bonus video for you. It is called The Eye is Part of the Central Nervous System. Hi, Medicosis, I don't understand. What are you trying to say? Shut up. You have heard of the old adage that says that the eye is a window to the soul. Medicosis will say the eye is a window to the central nervous system. In fact, the retina of the eye is part of the brain, and I'm not being facetious. And not just the eye, the eye and the optic nerve are part of the CNS, specifically the diencephalon. And this point has huge implications, clinically speaking. So let's go back to square one. Embryology, baby. The trilaminal embryo is endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. Ectoderm is on the outside. Ectoderm is the one that's going to give you your nervous system. Ectoderm is divided into neuroectoderm and surface ectoderm. Neuroectoderm, we have the neural tube and the neural crest. Neural tube, central nervous system. Neural crest, peripheral nervous system. Where do you think your optic nerve originated from? Since I've just told you that the optic nerve is part of the CNS, the optic nerve is gonna be a part of the neural tube. All of the other cranial nerves and all of the spinal nerves are part of the neural crest because they are part of the peripheral nervous system. So here is your beautiful ectoderm. You have surface ectoderm and you have neural plate. Then you have the mesoderm here with the notochord and you will have the endoderm here. The neural plate will start to invaginate and the border will become the neural crest. Now you have the surface ectoderm for the epidermis of the skin, the neural crest for the peripheral nervous system, and the neural tube for the central nervous system. The brain and spinal cord will come from the neural tube. The peripheral nervous system, which includes all of your spinal nerves and all of your cranial nerves, except cranial nerve number two, will originate from the neural crest. So let's imagine that this is the spinal cord. As you know, the spinal nerves will emerge from the spinal cord to the outside. So it makes perfect sense that the spinal cord came from the neural tube, but the spinal nerves are part of the neural crest. Moreover, what is the name of this cavity here? Well, this is the cavity that will be filled with cerebrospinal fluid later. So in the spinal cord, this is called the central canal, and in the brain, this is called ventricles. And all of these structures originated from the neural tube. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. This is the neural tube. It will give you the spinal cord and the brain. The brain originates as three vesicles. The prosencephalon, or the forebrain, mesencephalon, or the midbrain, rhombencephalon, or the hindbrain. The prosencephalon will give you telencephalon and diencephalon. Telencephalon will give you cerebral hemispheres, basal ganglia. Diencephalon will give you thalamus, hypothalamus, mammillary bodies, amygdala, etc. Cranial nerve number one originates from the telencephalon. Cranial nerve number two originates from the diencephalon. And therefore, there is a connection between your brain and your optic nerve, and therefore, with your eyes. Here is your diencephalon. Here is the optic nerve during embryological development. It started as an optic vesicle. And then this optic vesicle will touch and interact with the lens placode. Later, here is the diencephalon. Here is the optic nerve. Here is your eye. Now, this is unique to the optic nerve. Why is this? Because as you know, central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system are cranial nerves and spinal nerves. All of your cranial nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system, except cranial nerve number two. So cranial nerve number two is actually part of the central nervous system. Let's go back to definitions. A collection of somas in the central nervous system is known as a nucleus. A collection of somas in the peripheral nervous system is known as a ganglion. A collection of axons in the central nervous system is a tract and a collection of axons in the peripheral nervous system is a nerve. So actually, we should have called the optic nerve an optic tract because it's actually part of the central nervous system. But of course, had we called it an optic tract, doctors will forget to check for the optic nerve when they are examining cranial nerves 1 through 12 clinically. So I hope by now it is clear that the eye and the optic nerve are part of the central nervous system, specifically the diencephalon. Now here is the clinical implication. Remember multiple sclerosis? Oh yeah, it was demyelination of the central nervous system. Okay, do you remember Guillain-Barré syndrome? Yeah, it was demyelination of the peripheral nervous system. Okay, now here's the question. Which one of these two diseases actually affect the optic nerve? 
If you come by the naive assumption that the optic nerve is like any other nerve part of the peripheral nervous system, you will say that the Guillain-Barre affects the optic nerve. Nonsense. Multiple sclerosis is the actual one that affects the optic nerve because it is a demyelination of the central nervous system and the optic nerve is part of the central nervous system. I rest my case. That's why during ophthalmological exam of a patient with multiple sclerosis, you might find optic neuritis or retrobulbar neuritis. What was the definition of a tract? A collection of axons in the central nervous system. That is true. I will also call the optic nerve optic tract, but I know it's going to be confusing. So understand that the optic nerve and the optic tract are both part of the central nervous system. And this is the only cranial nerve, by the way, that has a tract even before it goes to its center inside the brain. Since there is a connection between the eye and the optic nerve, and there is a connection between the optic nerve and the brain, therefore increase intracranial pressure when you have tons of CSF around your brain, eventually is gonna show up on your eye, and just by looking at the patient's fundus, you will see papilledema. Cause medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. And it gets better. You can treat refractory intracranial hypertension through a procedure known as optic nerve fenestration. Basically, you poke teeny tiny holes in the optic nerve to relieve the pressure from around the brain because they are connected with each other. How do I diagnose increased intracranial pressure? Of course, you can measure it. There are some equipment to measure it. And you can clinically assess it through the Cushing reflex, which is a triad of hypertension, bradycardia, and irregular breathing. Get an ophthalmoscope and look at the patient's fundus, dead in the eye, and you will see papilledema. How do I treat intracranial hypertension? Head elevation, hyperventilation, diuretics, dexamethasone, and then you shunt. You can shunt it between the vertebral canal and the peritoneum to relieve the pressure from the central nervous system, or you can do optic nerve fenestration, which is a connection between the brain and the eye. Why head elevation? Because gravity will pull the fluid downwards and away from your brain. Why hyperventilation? Because when you hyperventilate, <laughs> you wash away your carbon dioxide. When carbon dioxide decreases, it will cause constrictions of the vessels that are supplying your brain. Vasoconstrictions of the cerebral blood vessels will lead to decreased cerebral perfusion, which will decrease the fluid overload in your brain. Diuretics make perfect sense. We want to get rid of the excess of fluid. Dexamethasone, when in doubt, give steroids. Now let's talk about methanol intoxication. Methanol is the same as wood alcohol. This is very toxic to your central nervous system. And wait, imagine my shock. It's also toxic to your optic nerve. It can cause blindness. The patient will describe the visual anomalies as it's as if I'm walking through a snowstorm. I can't see anything. Methanol causes metabolic acidosis, it causes ketosis, it elevates your anion gap, it elevates your osmolar gap. The source is a windshield wiper fluid. Symptoms include CNS toxicity, optic nerve papillitis, and blindness. You treat with fomipizole, ethanol, and when the bleep hits the fan, dialysis. Okay, where do your cranial nerves originate from? Well, two of them originate from the forebrain. And then the second two will originate from the midbrain. Then the next four from the pons. And the last four from the medulla. So cranial nerve one and two from the forebrain. If you want to be more sophisticated, one comes from the telencephalon and two comes from the diencephalon. Three and four, they come from the midbrain. And imagine my shock, they have to do with eye function. Because I don't know if you have noticed, but most of the eye reflexes, if not all of them, have their center in the midbrain. Cranial nerves 5, 6, 7, and 8 from the pons. 9, 10, 11, 12 from the middle. If you are looking at a specimen, you will see 8 emerging at the pontum medullary junction. This is so deep. The implications of the fact that the optic nerve is part of your central nervous system does not stop here. Let's talk about normal first. Okay, normally you have a right cerebral hemisphere and a left cerebral hemisphere. Between them, there is a corpus callosum. Okay, but embryologically speaking, you only had one hemisphere or one cerebrum 
and it later divided into two compartments. Same thing, the eyes divide at the same point as the cerebral hemispheres divide into two. But what if they do not divide? Well, that's a pathology. You will end up with one humongous hemisphere and a one humongous giant eye. If you remember old cartoons like Hercules, there was a character known as Cyclops. What people did not understand, whether children or adults, that the word Cyclops came from the medical condition known as Cyclopia, which means literally one giant eye in the middle. Some clinical pros for the pros. If you are a competent doctor, if your patient has one eye in the center, this patient probably has holy prosencephaly. The two cerebral hemisphere did not divide. This one has just one humongous cerebrum. By the same embryological token, if your patient was born with just one kidney, this male patient probably has just one testicle. And vice versa, if the patient is born with one testicle, assuming that the other testicle is not hiding inside, called cryptorchidism, this patient probably has one kidney as well. This happens in some patients, but not all patients. And this is the difference between a competent doctor and a doofus. A doofus nephrologist will say, oh, I did an MRI on the abdomen and I found one kidney. This is just my job. Uh, the testicles is the job of the urologist. I have nothing to do with the testicle. Doofus. That's not a physician. That's a box checker at best. It's like those woke people who work at corporate, whose main function is to forward the email to the next person in the dominance hierarchy. Actually thinking about helping the customer is of no interest to them, with some exceptions. And there are even more implications. If you recall the structure of the spinal cord, your spinal cord had about six different sulci. Here is a sulcus, here is a sulcus, here is a sulcus, here is a sulcus. Here is a sulcus, but we don't call it a sulcus, we call it a septum, and here is a sulcus. Of course, you know why do we have a sulcus here? Oh, okay, why medicosis? Because there is an afferent nerve. Okay, why do we have a sulcus here? Because there is an efferent nerve. Here, same thing, efferent, and here is afferent. But why the flip? Do you have an anterior median fissure and a posterior median septum? Why? Because remember, at the same moment, your cerebrum divided into two cerebral hemisphere, your eye divided into two eyes, your optic nerve divided into two nerves, and your spinal cord divided at the midline, giving you the anterior median fissure and the posterior median septum. If your woke anatomy professor explained it to you like this, I will retire from YouTube and work for a garbage company. If you want to master neuro, check out my CNS pharmacology course on my website, medicosisperfectionandis.com. You can also get my brand new acid-base imbalances course to learn about kidney physiology, kidney pharmacology, and all of the aspects of acid-base disturbances. And you can get a 40% discount towards anything on my website. Just use promo code ACIDBASE. It's only available for the next three students only. Let's review increased intracranial pressure assessment or diagnosis by referring to this great picmonic. All right, what's going on here? How do I know that the increased intracranial pressure... Look at... Oh, man. That's a pressure cooker right there, no pun intended. First thing you have is loss of consciousness. As you see, this guy here has lost his God-given mind. Next is headache. Oh, yeah, head egg. And there is the Cushing triad of irregular breathing, widening of the pulse pressure, and bradycardia. Look at that snail heart right here, bradycardia. Your brain doesn't have one inch of empty space. Therefore, anytime you have increased intracranial pressure, it's going to press on some structures of the brain, and you will end up with projectile vomiting, which is actually good for you because your body is trying to relieve the pressure. But of course, everything has pros and cons. Vomiting can lead to hypochloremic, hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. If you look at the pupils, they are abnormal because remember, there is a connection between your eye and your brain. Your eyes are the windows to your soul. The eyes are the window to the CNS. There is papilledema depicted here by pop high edamame. And sometimes the patient develop a certain posture. In this photo right here, look, look at her hands. It looks like a C. So this is called decorticate rigidity or decorticate posture. 
Where do you think the problem is? Well, it's called decorticate. The problem is in her cerebral cortex. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my CNS pharmacology course, my acid-based course, my antibiotics course, and others. And go to pickmonic.com to get these wonderful pictured mnemonics. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.